Well, we are in Genesis chapter 33, and you can turn there. Uh, We're going to look at the entire chapter. There's 20 verses. And the title is, What is Needed to Restore Broken Relationships? So we've been following Jacob's life, and the one thing that you know is that there is a terrible rift that has taken place between he and his twin brother Esau. And they, uh, 20 years earlier, had reached the breaking point. Um, because Jacob went in on the advice of mom to deceive father Isaac and pretended to be Esau to receive a blessing that um, Isaac was intending to give to Esau as the elder son, the firstborn twin. And um, so she hears about this and she says, Jacob, you got to go in there and pretend to be your brother and make sure that he blesses you. So that's exactly what he did. He went in and pretended to be his brother, lied to his father, and um, received that blessing. When Esau found out, he's like, I'm going to kill that kid. I'm going to kill him. As soon as dad is dead, I'm taking him out. So mom heard this, and she says, okay, you got to leave. And so that happened 20 years earlier. Now, fast forward, he's coming back in, and um, he has 11 sons. He has one daughter. Um, and two wives and two handmaidens and coming back with all kinds of flocks and all kinds of you know servants he's coming back into the land and he's afraid he sent out some messengers with that carefully crafted letter that said hey I'm coming back my lord I hope all is well with you here's some gifts for you and the guys come back and say yeah he's coming he's got 400 guys with him And this causes great distress to come upon Jacob's heart there in chapter 32. And eventually he just calls out to the Lord and says, Lord, just bless me. I need your blessing. And we head into chapter 33 with as a backdrop. So we're going to just look at their life. We're going to pick up a few points as we move. But the the main theme that I want to follow through is how did uh, these two brothers get reconciled? And what can we glean for our own life in restoring broken relationships? So first of all, verses 1 and 2 says, Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. You say, well, that seems like favoritism. Well, that's exactly what that is. And it doesn't go well in the house. They're going to deal with the consequences of this rivalry that was uh, put in place you know, by, by dad and is not going to go well. So, but this is what he's doing. He's dividing him up. And from the, the handmaidens all the way to his favored wife, uh, Rachel, and his favored son, Joseph. Uh, But he's afraid, and he's concerned. He's expecting that there's going to be um, bloodshed. That's why he sent the gifts ahead to try and just calm things down. This is why he's separating the family. He's going to, we'll find in the next verse or two, that he's going to be at the front of this. So he's not at the back, but he's at the front. And he's going to meet his brother Esau first. So at least we, we can give him that. Uh, but he's, he's anticipating this to, to be fulfilled just the way Esau said, that he was going to kill him. Although Isaac is not dead at this time, Isaac is still alive. You know, they need to meet. And that's kind of the first point we're going to see. They're going to end up being reconciled, but every reconciliation has to have a meeting. And those are not fun. And they can cause all kinds of fear. And there can be a sense of distress that comes to us. And we can be thinking, oh, no, I don't want to see them. Because the last time I saw them, they hurt me and they did all of these things. And it's bringing up all of those emotions. And it's bringing up all of that pain. And I just don't want to, I don't want to go there again. Or maybe as I'm afraid that if I give them another opportunity to hurt me, they're going to hurt me. And I, I don't want to do that. But every reconcil- in every reconciliation, there must be a meeting. You must meet with that person. And I'm going to call you, more importantly, the Word of God is going to call all of us to make certain that as far as it lies within us, to seek to live peaceably with all men and restore those relationships that are broken. So you need to meet with them. If you just stay in your place and they stay in their place, 
you can pretty much be guaranteed that the relationship will stay in that same fallen, broken state. And Jesus actually encourages us to go to these types of meetings. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 26, now in fairness, this is a meeting that's not really coming out of Esau's goodwill or Jacob's desire to reconcile. This is a meeting that's just being forced upon him, and God can force meetings upon us as well. But here's the way he wants us to handle it. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly. So if it's actually gotten to a legal level, while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison, assuredly I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And so there's an account that, is, that needs to be paid as far as Esau is concerned. And he's coming and he's going to speak with his brother about it. And, um, you know, he, Jacob is fearful for his life and for his family. That's why we see all this maneuvering and all this wrestling that, that is taking place. But let me ask you this question, and it's not just Troy asking, but based upon what we read is, have you gone to that person that you've done wrong against? Well, you know, I, I went to them, but then they did something against me, and so now we just don't talk anymore. Okay, have you reached a level of reconciliation with them? Because if you haven't, the word from God is you need to go and make that right with them. He says, I want you to worship me, but before you go worship me, go get it right with them. Go work things out between you two, and then come and worship me. This is a heart and the desire of the Lord. Just keep on reading. So the point number one, it's pretty basic, but you've got to decide that if you're going to be, see a relationship restored, that you're going to go into that uncomfortable, vulnerable meeting and you're going to seek for restoration. Number two uh, is in verse three. Then he crossed over before them. So again, he was in front and he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. If you're going to go into that meeting, you need to go with humility. You need to go with the sense of brokenness. And Jacob is a broken man. He has taken him 20 years and the, the hand of God and the circumstances of God and being deceived and taken advantage of um, by Uncle Laban. But he has finally arrived at this place where he is willing to show humility. Now, again, circumstances are, are no doubt bearing pressure, but he could have easily gone in a different direction. But he decides to go and meet with him. Bowing down seven times may not really relate so much in our culture, in our relationships, but we get the idea. Seven being the number of completion and bowing down as a way to show that I am in subjection to you. I'm yielded to you. I come, I don't mean to do you any harm. I come and I recognize your place over me. That's powerful because of what Jacob had done to Esau because he wanted to grab everything and make his name great and he wasn't afraid to trample his brother in the process. Got to have humility when you go to make uh, restoration. If you don't go with humility, I can tell you how that's going to end. It's going to end with more fireworks. It's, gonna, it's going to get worse. There can never be reconciliation until there is brokenness on, on the part of the offender and a brokenness on the part of the offended to receive that person. Esau would have seen Jacob on his face essentially saying, I respect you, brother. I submit to you, brother. I am not a threat to you, brother. That's what's happening as he bows down seven times. Pride worked in the past to say, I'm the chosen one. You're the lazy one. I'm the spiritual one. You're the carnal one. And that's how they got to this place. Humility has come into his life through those hard lessons, as I mentioned, with Uncle Laban. On his, the night he got married and worked for seven years to marry his sweetheart, Rachel, he went in and to the wedding chamber, came out, dark room, veiled, maybe a little intoxicated. We talked about that. And as he came out, he realized, wait a minute. That's not Rachel. That's 
Rachel's older sister, Leah, and he was deceived. He was deceived because, remember what Laban says, he goes, well, we have a custom in our country that the older should not come behind the younger, which is, of course, he had broken that tradition that was also in his culture. But uh, so he, he feels that. Then, then the, the uh, wages are changed 10 times by Laban. And then his brother-in-laws, they want to take him out. And so he knows what it's like. And the Lord can put you through circumstances. So if you're thinking, I'm not going to meet, I'm not going to meet. I know I should, but I just can't. Well, I want you to know that the Lord loves you so much and he is going to continue to shape you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And what is more like Jesus than forgiving? So if you think you can run away from this, believer, child of God, you are wrong. You're not going to be able to run away from it. The Lord is going to continue to work on you and move in your life. And if you're at the point say, well, well, you know what? I've never been reconciled and I'm pretty much okay with it. Then you have another issue to be concerned about. Why is it that you're no longer hearing the corrective voice of God in your life? That should drop you to your knees and a fear of why is that? So listen, the Lord will get you to this place one way or another. You can come the short way and follow Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, or you can go the long way and go through a whole lifetime of learning a lesson that you would finally be ready to show humility before the person that you have done wrong to. So you need to have a meeting, and you need to go to that meeting with humility. And brokenness. You need to take that low spot. I don't know what the seven bow down moments may be in that reconciliation process, but you need to think about that. You know the circumstances, you know what took place, and you need to say, Lord, show me how I can reveal to them that I am truly sorry and I walk in humility. Because that's what humility shows is a sense of, of regret and remorse for what you've done. Look at verses four and five the need to forgive. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. There might have been a tense moment for Jacob here, right? He's running at me. He is, I'm, you know, I, I, I would assume Jacob is still laid out before him. And he hears him running. Oh, no, what's he going to do? Getting close. And now he feels the body coming down upon him. And then he feels the lips of his brother on his neck. And he hears him crying. And he hears him kissing him, and he's embracing him. And then he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, who are these with you? Now, if he was angry, he would have said, and who are these? But I don't think that's what he said at all. I'm sure he said it like, well, who are these people? He knew who they were. Introduce me. I want to know your family. I want to be connected with your family. And I love Jacob's response, a further display of humility. He said, the children to whom God has graciously given your servant. The need to forgive. All right, so you need to go to that person. You need to go with humility. But when that person comes to you, because if you're on this side of being the uh, offended, then you need to receive them when they come to you. Yeah, but they hurt me. Yeah, that's why you're offended. That's kind of the way it works here. And, you know, in relationships... The closer you are to a person and the more you trust them, the more opportunity they have to hurt you. But the more opportunity you have to enjoy a relationship and to live life together and to rejoice over things and to, to go through trials and difficulties and hardships and to have that. The idea, well, I'm just not going to forgive, it really is not an option. Because you're going to become a lonely, isolated person. And so... This is what we see in Esau. Even Esau, a man who was, was carnal, a man who didn't value the spiritual, a man who was marrying women who were worshiping false gods, he embraces and he forgives. It wasn't just cold words, okay, I forgive you. Now be gone. No, I mean, he is showing his brother, I forgive you for what's happened. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 with me. Turn to Ephesians 4. It's going to be up on the screen, actually. Verse 31. It says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us 
and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Scripture calls you to forgive. Scripture calls the uh, offender to go to the one that's offended, and Scripture calls for the one that is offended to forgive. And and we're given the example. We are to forgive like God forgave us in Christ Jesus. That's how you are to forgive. And it should be as a sweet-smelling aroma. God took the initiative. God made the sacrifice. God bore the brunt of the wrong. And this is how we are to go about making things right with one another. I didn't write these. You can read it. This is not high English here. This is pretty low-level stuff. I'm sure you understand what it's asking. You need to look like Jesus. If we were to put it in terms like this, what does your attempt to make things right and show forgiveness smell like? Is it a sweet-smelling aroma? Or, Or is this something that's maybe, it's odorless. I mean, like, it's neutral. There's nothing. You're not being mean. You're not being kind you're not being tender hearted it's just it's just it's an odorless attempt to make it right or is it just a foul thing that's going on and maybe you've been hiding that stench in your own heart in your own life and we read let all bitterness wrath anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away and you maybe you've hid this from everybody maybe people don't even know the depth of bitterness and anger and wrath that is within you because that's not the way christians are to behave but you know it's there More importantly, God knows it's there. And you've been holding on to it. And you've found it's almost become like your partner as to have this anger and to have this wrath and to have this bitterness. You're like, well, what would I even do with my life and my free time and my thoughts if I didn't have this any longer? Oh, the Lord would replace it with so many beautiful things. He would restore it. And he's like, well, i got to protect myself. Well, wait a minute. The Bible says something like this. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Are you waiting in bitterness, waiting in wrath and anger so you can steal what is God's? And that's vengeance. Let the Lord be the Lord and you be you. And what you've been called and I've been called to do is to forgive like God did in Christ Jesus. That is the way it is supposed to look. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I don't know if I can do that. That seems a little unfair. You don't understand how offended I have been by this person. And that probably is true. Maybe I don't know the story. I would venture to say I probably don't know most of your stories. But you know what? Matthew chapter 18, I do want you to turn there. It's a classic teaching on how we are to forgive. So turn with me to Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. Peter was having a pretty good day, and he thought he would show his spiritual stuff off. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? Never mind, don't don't answer. I know, seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times 7. 70 times 7. 490 times? I don't know that I can even keep track of it. Bingo. I don't want you to keep track of the offenses and how many times you've forgiven somebody. 70 times 7 is not meant to give you a number to know how many times you should forgive somebody. And if you're up to 426, I'm sorry to break the news to you, you're not almost over. It's that you always forgive. Every time somebody comes to make things right, you forgive them. Well, I don't know about that. Well, let me ask you this. How many times has the Lord forgiven you in a day? Seven times? 490 times? Aren't you glad he doesn't have a counter in heaven that's going? I mean, what if you got saved and the Lord says, I'm so glad you're part of the kingdom and one day I'm coming back for you or, if, you know, who knows, I don't know the day or the hour, but you may end up coming to me before I come for you. But just, just know this, you got seven get out, of car, get out of jail free cards. After that, this relationship is over. What if you only had seven times and after the seventh time you were done with God? 490. I feel pretty confident. I'm looking out here. I'm kind of assessing everybody. All of us have used more than 490 times with God. All of us. So this isn't 
meant to be, you forgive, but only up to a point. And so Jesus wants to explain it to him. Verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I don't know exactly how much that is, but let's call it $50 million. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow uh, servants who owed him about a hundred denarii, $8,000. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Sound familiar? Well, different response, verse 30. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had, what had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that he had done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So, my heavenly Father also will do to each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Forgive from your heart. I mean, this is a sobering passage. It is meant to cause us to sit up straight. But the clear teaching is we are to be a people who forgives. I know I keep saying this, but I, but I like it. We live in a cancel culture, but we are a redemption culture. Amen. And we need to be careful with this. Because we look at people and say, well, they made that mistake, and they made that mistake, and I'm done with them, and I'm done with that. And, you know, be careful. Because you've made mistakes too. I've made mistakes. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have not lived perfect lives. And we have a Bible full of heroes that made mistakes that were forgiven. And God shows us through them that he works through imperfect people. And so when we are living in the day that we are, where it's like, well, I'm going to cancel this person and not get anything to do with them. You know, this is something that is going to backfire on, on every single person who does this one day. You're going to reap what you sow. And we are to be sowing in forgiveness and mercy and in grace. Now, this is hard because if you've been offended in a particularly terrible way, it's hard. But here's the, here's the reality. The worst anybody can do to you is $8,000. But your sin against Jesus, 50 million bucks. You sinned against him. You rebelled against him. And it caused the creator of the universe. I sinned against him. I rebelled against him. And my sin put the creator of the universe on the cross he was beaten, he was spat upon, he was nailed to the tree, crown of thorns was thrust into his head because of me. That's a pretty serious offense, to sin against the Creator. And yet he forgives us. And even in all that he endured, that my sin caused him to, to uh, go through, I was finding forgiveness in that. That's how I was being forgiven. The worst anybody can do to you is 8,000 bucks. But you know, a lot of us walk around with a $50, $50 infraction. And we are like, I will never forgive that person. I'm going to hold on. You know, I was a fool once, but I'll never be a fool twice. Wait a minute, what's a fool? Is a fool forgiving somebody who comes to you and as best as you can tell is coming to you in repentance? Well, yeah, but I'm not certain. Well, Okay, who's certain of your repentance? As a matter of fact, I think if you were to check it out, when I came to Jesus and I said I repent, he knew that I was going to sin again. 
I mean, we're not talking about people coming and be, you know, sinless, you know, saints that are, you know, like angels who never fall and make any transgression. There's going to be more error if, you, if you're around them. So this idea that we're putting up a standard for them that if God was to put up for us, none of us would be accepted. And so we need to walk humbly. We need to walk. And, and here's, again, is the thing. Esau's forgiving. Esau's forgiving. Not known as a good guy in Scripture. And yet here, he is moved and he is touched by the humility of his brother. So if somebody comes to you, you need to forgive them. Well, how do I know they're really repentant? I don't know. Let's ask that question in about six months, and then maybe you'll have a really good answer. But you got to give them the benefit of the doubt. you got to give them that chance. Now listen. I, and I don't want to get off into all the exceptions because the, the message is repentance. But, I mean, maybe somebody's done something criminally against you and, you know, there's other factors that are now involved besides just a personal relationship matter. I'm not really, you know, there are nuances of that. And if you want to get some counseling, the pastors are here. You can call and we'll be glad to sit down and talk with you about that. However, we are called to forgive. That's what we're talking about right now is to forgive people. Now, I love Jacob's response to the question. It's like, well, who, who are all these people, Jacob? And he goes, these people, all of these people, and all of this stuff? Well, you know me. You know me, Esau. You, nobody ever gets one over on me. There's this guy named Laban, and he tried to change my wages ten times, but I kept on having a, a comeback for it, and God helped me. But, you know, I'm a smart guy. I'm kind of a conniver. You know, Jacob. I don't think that Esau would have felt very good about the hug and the kiss he just gave him. What do you think? He would have been like, ah, same guy. I don't know about this. But that's not what Jacob says. And he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. If you begin to talk about grace, you're immediately talking about that which you don't deserve. You're talking about a favor and a kindness that has come to you that is not deserving. So essentially, what he says to Esau is, he goes, who are these? Brother, this is a blessing upon my life that I don't deserve. You know that and I know that. But God has blessed me like this. It's God's favor. Again, another statement of humility. Look at verses 6 through 8. Verses 4 and 5 is the need to forgive. But verses 6 and 8 is the need to be forgiven. I'll have to develop this a little bit, but I think it's, a, it's an important point. Then the maidservants came near and their children and bowed down, so all of his sons, right? And Leah also came with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, what do you mean by all this company which I met? Here it is. And he said, these are to find favor in your sight, or to find favor in the sight of my Lord. He needed to have that grace. He needed to have that forgiveness. At one point, I'm not going to develop it much, but you'll identify it quickly and you can just begin to contemplate it. You know, when two people, Jacob and Esau, get in a conflict, they're fighting, they're arguing, they're speaking words together, they're hugging, they're kissing, and they're making up. That's not happening for Rachel. That's not happening for Leah or any of the sons. They are the ones that are being reconciled. And don't be unlike them when your spouse or your son or your daughter or your friend goes and makes it right with the person that they've had a, uh, some kind of uh, estrangement from. Don't be one saying, no, 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 don't go, don't go. I just don't want to do that. No, you need to be like, Rachel and Leah, you need to be bowing down to, you need to be encouraging that process. And so often God can work in somebody's heart or life. And I am believing that God's going to speak to our hearts today. And we're going to go out of this place and we're going to begin to make things right. Don't get in the way and begin to say, I don't think you should do this. I think you need to be careful and begin to put roadblocks up and their desire to make reconciliation. You know, it's easy, you know, if somebody comes and you know, your child gets married and they're out there and they report back to you. Yeah, you know, my husband or my wife has done this, this, and this to me. I can't believe they said it. You know, mom and dad are getting hot at home. Like, I can't believe this. Man, when they get here, I'm going to, and you're getting all fired up. But, you know, a few hours later, they call up and say, hey, can we come over tonight? You know, and you're like, what do you want to, you guys are back, you're, you worked out? Yeah, we're, 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 oh, we're fine, we're fine, it's great. Can we come over? And now they come over. You didn't get the benefit of reconciliation, did you? 
You didn't get the chance to work through all of that. You just heard that they, your daughter, your son, your spouse, your friend worked through that. And you got to be you got to guard your own heart that it's not so full of bitterness that you begin to stop them or slow them down. And so here you see a family, they all walk in humility. And he says, what is all this about? I need favor. These are to find favor. This is a noun, and it means to find favor. The Hebrew word is hen, but it means, it means translated favor, grace, or acceptance. What is, what is he saying to him? These are to be accepted by you, brother. I'm not content to not be accepted by you. I, I am giving you all of these things, and I am bowing down these seven times, and my family is bowing down before you because we want to be accepted by you. Isn't that an important element in restoration? Because you can meet with somebody who says all the right words and they're doing all the right things, but you just sense they really don't care about making these things right with me. They're just walking through some process. And when we feel that and when we sense that, it shuts down that reconciliation process. But for Jacob, he's saying, no, I want to be accepted by you. And that person you have offended, they need to know that. You, it is your responsibility, it is my responsibility to communicate to them, I'm not okay with us being broken and being estranged. I have to have your favor. I have to have your acceptance in my life. And that communicates to that person that you're ready to enter into a relationship and to value it. But as long as you're like, ah, who cares, whatever, I don't need them in my life anyways, I don't, you know, favor or acceptance, I don't care, my life will probably be better off with that. Oh, you have not been truly broken yet. It's when you get to that place of brokenness where like, I, I need to have them accept me. Now, listen, Jacob is a, a, you know, he's not this perfect saint. I mean, he's also concerned about his own flesh. Let's be real about it, right? He's worried about being killed and things being stolen, his family being taken. But nonetheless, as imperfect as it is, we see here that attitude. So if you have kind of settled in and said, well, I don't need them anyway. Well, then may the Lord change that in your life and bring you to the place where they, you're able to communicate to them, yeah, I've done wrong. And I want your acceptance. Now, the verb form of this word hen, um, just I'll read to, as one person defines it, an action from a superior to an inferior who has no real claim for gracious treatment. Esau, you're the superior. I'm the inferior. And I have no grounds by which to ask for acceptance. But I'm asking it anyway. You shouldn't forgive me. I have not earned your forgiveness or your kindness or another chance to have a relationship with you, but would you? That is the posture that he takes. Acknowledging acknowledging your wrong and expressing the need for mercy are important elements in reconciling with a person. Hopefully when you hear a person calling out for mercy, the Spirit of God is moving in your heart and that you will not be able to resist that, but you will be able to welcome that, even as the Lord welcomes us. Look at verses 9 through 11. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I have found favor, acceptance in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God. Like, God could have judged me, and you could have judged me. And you were pleased with me. Please Take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So he urged him and he took it. You know, when Jacob had a similar conversation with Laban, they said, we'll make a treaty. Don't come past this pile of rocks and you don't come past this pile of rocks. And that's kind of the way it ended. But here Jacob knows that he's the offender. Jacob knows that he has done wrong. And so he seeks to make restitution for what, it, you know, it, for his actions. Now, there was never really any property that was lost to speak of that we know of, but it was the, it was the attitude and the threat and the action that says, I'm going to take your inheritance. And um, so dad's still alive. He's coming back in. He's like, no, no, no. I don't want anything from you. 
And so what my heart intended on taking from you wrongly, please let me give back to you in, in reality um, so that you know that I am serious. You know, there are times where you've got to make restora- restitution for the wrong you've done to somebody. And, you know, if you've taken money, if you've taken a job and you didn't do what you're supposed to do or somebody did work for you and you didn't pay them and you want to make it right, go give them money. That helps to make it right because until you do that, it doesn't feel, well, what's money? Well, here's what's money. In the law of Moses, it said that if you sinned against your brother, that you were to go and you were to return that. And often there was a 20% fine added on to whatever you did. So making restitution is, is it's an important part of getting things right. Now, Jacob or Esau's like, no, no, you don't have to do it. But Jacob's like, no, 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 you have to do this. Because I don't want this to ever come back. I don't want this to ever be an issue. Because if you take this right now from me, then what that means is you acknowledge, I've acknowledged my wrong. You acknowledge that I've made it right. And I want to have that. And so he did receive the gift from Jacob. So maybe you need to make restitution. Maybe you've said all the right words, but you've never once tried to give um, back to the thing that you caused damage on. Verses 12 through 17. Um, Yeah, this is not a good point here. Um, Well, actually, it's the next section, but this sets it up. So Jacob requests um, to travel alone. Uh, Esau said, let us take our journey. Let us go. So, hey, let's do this together, brother. And I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. And Esau said, now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. Because he said, but he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. So Jacob was afraid that if the 400 men wanted to get back home, they would go too fast and he couldn't keep up. And he didn't want them to stay behind. And we're going to find out why. Because he's not going to go. So he's making all, I mean, they just went through this whole process and, and, and he's, he's kind of being a deceiver again, unfortunately. Look at verse 17 through 20. Uh, Jacob doesn't go to Seir, but he travels to Succoth and Shechem. Um, and you can go ahead and put that map up there now. It says, And Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of that place is called Succoth. The, then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, and he came from Padam, or Padan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city. And he bought the parcel of land which he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamar, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there, and he called it El Elho uh, Israel, God, the God of Israel. So if you look at that map, um, you got that body of water called the Dead Sea, and you got kind of that that blue line that's going straight north. That's where Esau's coming from. That's Seir. You have the red line coming down at the top right of that map. He is coming out of um, Haran. This is where he's journeying. And where um, that arrow stops is right where he wrestled with the Lord, right where he meets Esau. So if he would have continued to go, he would have kept going down south. But instead, he turns hard right. And he actually, rather than heading in a southwest direction, he now goes in a northwest direction. He turns and he goes away. Now, he doesn't travel very far, and he gets down into an area that, you know, it's down by the, the, the Jordan. It's an area that would have been a good place to take care of the animals and all the rest. So you have all the reasons. But he's not honest with them. <laughs> he's not honest with them. It doesn't seem like he has any plan whatsoever to go. Scripture's kind of silent about this whole incident. So I don't want to elaborate on silence, but I do want to just say this. We need to follow through on what we say we're going to do. Amen. You go and have that meeting. You walk in humility. You, you, you ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness is received. Well, you make restitution. Now you need to follow through. And Jacob doesn't follow through. And it makes us all feel really terrible reading this story. 
I mean, I hope I get to heaven. It's like, no, I had every intention of doing that, and I couldn't come um, because the, the animals and the flocks were so weak, and so I sent a messenger down. The Bible doesn't say it. I, I mean, I hope I hear that when I get to heaven, but it doesn't, it's not what we see here. And so whatever actually took place, I do know this is true. you got to follow through with whatever you say you're going to do. And be a man and a woman of your word so that things might be able to be reconciled. So he, he camps at Succoth for a while, then eventually crosses the Jordan, goes into Shechem, uh, where Abraham came, and he sets up an altar there and he worships, a very public thing. And he says, all right, I'm going to worship God, and it's the God of Israel. He says, he's not participating with any of the other gods. He makes a very public stand. I'm here, and this is my God. And so we can be thankful for that. It really seems like, though, where he should have been going was to Bethel. This is where he had made the vow to the Lord, if you bless me and take care of me, and this will be the house of the Lord, and I will come, and I will pay a tenth. He's going to eventually end up at Bethel, but he's going to go through a lot of hard, hard things because he goes into Shechem, and we'll get into that in our next study. But I just want to wrap it up here. If you have a relationship that needs to be restored, then go meet with that person. Walk in humility. You need to forgive if that person comes to you, if you're on the other side of it. You need to go with the attitude of, I need to be forgiven. I want to have your approval and your acceptance. It matters to me what you think about me. Make restitution and then follow through. And just a few closing warnings here. I'm not going to elaborate But here's what's going to prevent this from happening. Bitterness. That deep-seated, terrible attitude, hatred maybe even, that you have towards that person. you got to let go of the bitterness. you got to let it go. You need to beware of unforgiveness. We hit that pretty hard with the parable that Jesus gave. That he expects us, the Father expects us to be a people of kindness and forgiveness, that we're a tender-hearted people. And bitterness is the exact opposite. That's a hard-hearted person when you've become bitter. Well, I'm justified. I'm sorry, you're not justified. You're not justified. Nobody is ever justified in their bitterness because the Lord has told us to even love our enemies. So it doesn't matter which way you skin this. Well, they're my enemy. Love them. You were Christ's enemy one day, and he went to the cross for you. And lastly, your pride. There's no way I could ever go and admit my wrong. I lied for so many years about never doing it, and I know that I did it, but there's no way I could go and admit it now. You've got to go and admit it. If you want there to be true restoration, you've got to go make it right. And so bitterness, unforgiveness, and pride, three things to be aware of that will keep you from being restored with other people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness and your grace towards us. That you forgave us. You came. You initiated the whole process. You didn't wait for us to come to you, and we were the offenders. And you tell us to forgive like that. And so, Lord, we pray for the grace and the strength to do that. I just want you to consider, is there somebody you need to go ask forgiveness from? Is there somebody that has come and asked for forgiveness, but you were very different than Esau? You let him have it again. They walked away. There was no embracing. There was no weeping. You need to forgive them. You've got to let it go. Because the Lord demands that of you. So think about those relationships. Is there a name, is there a face that you got to go make it right with? Go make it right. Decide right now you're going to make it right. But you know, this is an imperfect example of reconciliation. Got two guys doing the best they can. They, get, they make some great progress. But you know, there is a perfect example of reconciliation. The Lord came to reconcile you to God. He hung upon the cross. 
Maybe it's not reconciliation with another person that's needed today. It's reconciliation with God. You've been walking in sin. You've been offending him. You've not been yielded to him. You've been doing it your own way. You need to come to that superior. And you need to bow down as an inferior. And say, I want to be accepted by you. And if you don't want to be accepted by the Lord then you won't be accepted by the Lord. You have to come and say, hey, I want to find grace in your sight. What do I want to find grace? And here's the good news. That grace has already been put into place. It's already rolled out. Jesus has already come and became a man. He already died upon the cross for our sins. He already rose from the dead. And now he says, if you come to me, I will give you rest. I will forgive you. And you will become a new creation. And we will be reconciled. God wants to do that in your life right now. If you haven't come to him, then call upon Jesus. Ask him to forgive you. Confess your sin. And he will, he will pour that grace out. Lord, how... How blessed we are that our $50 million debt of sin has been forgiven. Thank you that you are kind. Thank you that you are tenderhearted towards us. Even when we were stubborn, even when we were hard-hearted, Lord, you came and you reconciled us to yourself. We thank you, Lord.